One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Welcome everyone. In today's Shadowcast, uh, we are going to be having a breakdown of all things evil in episode four, The Great Wave. Um, in this breakdown, we will be focusing on three regions, uh, the city of Numenor, uh, Eregion, and Khazad Dûm, um, and finally the Southlands uh, with the introduction of Adar, who we've been waiting to see. Um, before I begin though, I did want to touch base on my feelings about the music uh, and the score for the TV series. Uh, the musical score is composed by uh, Bear McCreary, uh, and of course the main title is by um, Howard Shore, who we all know worked on both the Lord of the Rings films and uh, the Hobbit films, and scored all six of those films in addition to the extended editions and really all music related to the Peter Jackson epic of films. Um, I'm so far really uh, happy with the music by McCreary. Um, it, it's a, it is reminiscent of the, the music, Howard Shore's music for The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit uh, films, uh, but it doesn't copy it. It sort of uh, takes us to a new place. It's familiar, but at the same time uh, gives us a new score or a new kind of music for uh, the second age. So I'm okay with that. Um, but then I did want to talk about Howard Shore's uh, title score. Um, you know, I you, I love Howard Shore's music. I loved everything that he did in The Lord of the Rings and, and of course, the Hobbit films. Um, and he's just a great uh, composer for really for all the films that he has done. But um, for this particular piece, I was hoping for something a little bit uh, stronger. You know, if you look at the score for the television series, The Game of Thrones, or The Vikings, or um, The Last Kingdom, they all have a very visceral, uh, uh, strong uh, introduction to the series that really draws you in. Um, and for some reason, I just, in listening to the Howard Shore theme, I, I can pick up some of the themes from The Lord of the Rings uh, and he's woven in some new uh, uh, soundscapes into uh, his score for the opening title. But for some reason, it just doesn't have that kind of epic feel that I was hoping for. Now, you know, I have to admit when I first, you know, when I first watched Game of Thrones and, and some of the other uh, series I mentioned, I, you know, I didn't really think about the opening score or the opening music to the television series that much. Uh, and it, it, it might be that over time, as I listen to all eight episodes and then into the uh, season two, that I'll begin to really enjoy the music more in, in the opening sequence. Uh, but right now, I just sort of feel like it's missing something. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, before I began um, uh, and just touch on that because I haven't really spoken about the music yet. Um, the uh, you know the the themes from the Lord of the Rings that come to mind are uh, the Minas Tirith theme um, and also the Bridge of Khazad Dûm, which I felt like was uh, you know just has that powerful kind of epic feel to it. I was kind of hoping for something more like that, um, but I'm very happy that Howard Shore is is contributing uh, whatever it is he is contributing to the series thus far, um, but. You know, we all have our likes and dislikes. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into uh, this, the episode four, the last wave of uh, this new episode for uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. In the land of Mordor, 
where the shadows lie. Let's begin this shadow cast on the shores of Numenor. I want to touch on a few items I saw that visualized the growing darkness in Middle-earth. This episode begins with a bang, as its name implies. We see Mariel, Queen Regent, in a sort of naming ceremony when the very foundations of Numenor begin to shake and shudder. As we watch, we see violent water crashing across the city of Armenolos, and a vast wave rises up over the island. Of course, it is only a dream, and the queen awakens, knowing she has seen a vision of the future. Next, we witness what looks to be an orchestrated anti-elf demonstration in the streets of the city. I feel certain that our Farazan is behind this. The leader of this group of protesters is also one of Farazan's king's men. It looks as though he is setting himself up to be the next king. This is followed by a scene of Galadriel, brought before the queen, and we begin to see that ruling Numenor is more complicated than it would seem. Galadriel speaks her mind and gets herself thrown in irons next to Halibrand. This entire set of scenes in Numenor is about the Queen Regent making a decision to either stand with the King's men or side with the faithful. She tries to straddle this complex political horse, but in the end must make a choice. Galadriel escapes her captors and climbs the tower of Tar Minister, where she hopes to find the true king of Numenor. She discovers he is ill and finds Mariel waiting for her. The queen shows Galadriel the fall of Numenor in the Palantir. The queen believes that to stop this from happening, she must quiet dissension by banishing the elf from the island. They force Galadriel to board a ship, which sets sail across the harbor. But then we see the leaves of the white tree begin to fall like snow across the city. This event changes the mind of the queen, because she sees it as a sign that the Valar are unhappy with Numenor. She announces she will now set sail with Galadriel and an army to fight the rise of Sauron in the Southlands. This does not fit squarely with canon, but it still fits within the story of Numenor and of Middle-earth. Now we move on to the Mines of Moria. I personally love all the images of khazad we have seen thus far. It definitely draws on the visual design of the Jackson films. But now we get to see Moria in all of its glory, how the dwarves lived in this vast kingdom under the earth. We begin this series of scenes in Eregion, where Celebrimbor and Elrond look upon the building of the new Forge Tower, where the rings of power will soon be made. Two significant things happen here. Celebrimbor tells Elrond that his father, Ariandil, told him that one day Celebrimbor's future would be in his son's hands. Hmm. An odd moment filled with foreshadowing. This is followed by Celebrimbor saying that Durin was avoiding him. I get the feeling that Celebrimbor may well be using Elrond's friendship with the younger Durin for his own sort of nefarious purposes. But I will have to see more before I can say this for sure. It may be that Sauron, in the guise of Anatar, has already made a connection with Celebrimbor. We then see Elrond in khazad He is trying to locate Durin and tries to find out from Disa where he is. 
we find out just how fiercely defensive she is of her people and her husband. However, later, Elrond overhears and discovers they are down in a secret mine. Elrond finds the hidden way and must open a secret dwarven door. Somehow he knows the password, which seems oddly like a fraternity handshake to me. He discovers a vein of Moria silver and is then confronted by Durin, who accuses him of trying to steal their new discovery. After taking an oath of secrecy, Durin tells Elrond about the new metal. Because it is so dangerous to dig, Durin III has forbidden its mining. Durin gives Elrond a piece of the Moria silver, and Elrond names it Mithril in Sindrin. I think it's interesting that they make a point of showing Elrond taking the silver. It makes me wonder if Celebrimbor will find it. There is a sudden cave-in, and it seems to me that you can almost hear a deep growl of the falling stone. Hmm. We then cut to Deza, singing a song to the stone to save those trapped in the mine, who are later pulled to safety. Durin curses his father for being too cautious, and there is a lovely moment where Elrond tells him the story of his father, and how much he longs to talk with him, but he is now a star crossing the heavens. This is followed by Durin three and Durin four in a father-son moment of reconciliation. Durin three suspects something and tells Durin to go to the elves of Linden and see what it is they know. Why the younger Durin does not go to Eregion, which is much closer, is a mystery to me. Though I have to say, overall, the scenes of Moria and the storyline are my favorite thus far. Now we come to the Southlands and the big reveal of Adar. We see the orcs parting like the Red Sea as Adar comes forth. then leans over a dying orc, as if he might heal him, but instead he drives the tip of a blade into his heart. An orc whispers the words, Nam Pak Aglursha, which appears to be words in orcish or maybe even the black speech. The folks at Nerd of the Rings have some inside information from Jed Brophy that this is some sort of orc death phrase. This scene tells us a great deal about the character of Adar. One moment, he seems to be looking on the orc with compassion, and then the next he kills him. Adar's expression seems to be on a razor's edge between sorrow and a lust to kill. My first impression of Adar was that he looked weak and conflicted. However, there are moments when he looks completely evil. Adar is going to be one complex character, and I like that. I can't wait to discover his story, which apparently won't be easy to come by. Erendir tries to question him, but Adar refuses to give up anything, except that he once lived on the same river as Erendir and Beleriand, the western half of Middle-earth that slid into the sea at the end of the First Age. As he talks about the river, I noticed he has a symbol of a river on his chest plate. Hmm. I also want to point out the knife Adar uses to kill the orc. I have a theory. It might be the tip of the black blade of fire and smoke we have seen. It looks like it could be made of the same metal. This might explain why Adar wants this blade so much, to bring the pieces together and to make it a formidable weapon. 
back to Adar. Instead of answering questions, Adar tells Arandir, Go to the men who have taken refuge in the old watchtower and deliver a message. Arandir is holding a piece of old metal in his fist and is ready to fight. Adar clearly sees it, but has no fear of death. Then we switch over to the watchtower of Ostirith. Bronwyn has become the leader in the absence of the elves. We see villagers from a place called Lorbad coming into the tower keep. Bronwyn says something very interesting at this point in the episode. She says, that makes every village from here to Aradron. I almost missed this reference, but looked closely at the spelling on the caption. I believe she is referencing the Sindrin name for Mount Doom, Oradruin, meaning mountain of red fire and flame. I have always pronounced it Oradruin, not Oradruin. Interesting, I still wonder if this might not be Mount Doom we see her in the distance. It may be that they're going to have a different pronunciation for Oradruin, Mount Doom. We witness an argument about provisions for the fortress. Theo and Rowan sneak back to the village to get more food, despite Bronwyn telling him not to. Rowan, who cut his finger on the black blade, is not looking so good. I wonder if he is being taken sick or made sick by the cut. It may even be possible that this blade was made in the dark fortress of the north and is imbued with the same dark sorcery used to gain access to the unseen world. Perhaps this is a precursor to the evil sorcery used in the Morgul blade by the Witch King on Weathertop. We need to keep an eye on this character and see what happens to him. As they move through the village, we find out that the animals have all been slaughtered and eaten by the orcs. They load up goods as they prepare to leave, and Theo says that they should look in the tavern for any more food. But Rowan refuses to enter any dark place. Theo goes alone. We see the sun going behind the clouds, and Rowan takes off, trying to keep within the safety of the light. Inside the tavern, Theo finds a bag of grain. As he scoops it up, the door of the tavern suddenly closes. From out of the shadow comes the orc Vrath. I believe it is Vrath. He attacks Theo, who uses the black blade to protect himself. He jams the hilt into his arm, and uses his blood to reform it into a blade of smoke and flame. Vrath is frightened, but also sees that Theo holds what his master has been seeking, the black blade. Theo runs outside, hiding in a well. The orcs begin searching for him, and Vrath thinks he hears something down in the well. But Theo hides under the water and saves himself. He hides there until dark. Rowan returns to the keep and tells them he lost Theo along the way. Bronwyn leaves to find him. After dark, Theo slips out of the well and dodges orcs left and right. This scene, in a funny sort of way, reminded me of playing the Shadow of Mordor game. Hmm. Just as Theo begins to sneak away, he is discovered by Vrath, who tries to kill him. Unfortunately, Wrath, the great hero orc, dies by the sword of Arondir. The two escape into the woods with an army of orcs on their heels. Bronwyn finds them and helps Theo get away as Arondir shoots the elves with his bow. They exit the woods as dawn breaks. There is a wonderful moment when the orcs hang back in the shadow of the woods As the sun rises over the hill, they scream in anger, realizing they have lost their prey. This scene is undercut with the scene of Diza singing to the rocks of Khazad-dûm. It is a beautiful and moving scene. We cut to the watchtower of Ostirith. Arondir delivers Adar's message to Bronwyn. 
you must forsake all claim to these lands and swear fealty to Adar. The camera cuts across the fortress, showing the families and what is at stake if they defy him. Theo is looking at the black blade and is seen by Waldridge, who confronts him about the bloody marks on his arm. Waldridge reveals the same marks as scar tissue on his own arm. He says the blade hilt is no sword, but a power fashioned for our ancestors by his master's own hand, a beautiful servant. He was lost, but he shall return. Have you heard of Sauron? Waldrich asks Theo if he has seen the signs of Sauron's return, the starfall. He looks intently at Theo and tells him, save your strength, you'll need it for what's coming. This scene gave me chills. Now, listening closely, it sounds as if Waldridge is saying that the Black Blade was made by Morgoth for his servant, Sauron. So this must be a powerful weapon of dark sorcery indeed. I can't wait to see Sauron take it up and use it. Finally, we cut to the orc tunnels as the warg munches on a snack of elven arm. Adar watches with a look of pride as the warg chews hungrily. An orc comes into frame and announces to Adar, We have found it. It's in the tower. This sets the stage for the coming battle at the watchtower of Astirith, where I assume Adar will try to acquire the black blade with the help of the orcs and possibly Waldridge. Well, it looks as though we have moved through most of the exposition and character development so that the narrative can now begin to move forward with speed. The next four episodes should really take off. Let's hope these last four live up to all the hype. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this uh, latest breakdown uh, of episode four of The Rings of Power. Um, I hope it was informative, and I hope I touched on some things in uh, all that is evil in Middle-earth that we see in the series. Um, uh, it looks like we have reached the halfway mark, um, and what I'm hoping to do is uh, give you guys a new episode breakdown a little bit sooner than, you know, almost a week later. Um, this well, we're here on Thursday, and you know it it came last Friday. I uh, just wasn't able to get to it earlier, um, but hopefully I'm going to shoot for getting the next episode breakdown no later than Sunday night or Monday morning. Um, I'm also planning to do a final video uh, at the conclusion of the series where I talk, where I sort of do an overall review of the eight episodes and season one, uh, and give my thoughts on whether I really feel like the series is true to Tolkien uh, or at least uh, to the essence of the Lord of the Rings, the, you know, uh, the Hobbit and the world of Middle Earth. Um, so until next time, uh, I hope to see you walking through the door of Samith Nuor, uh, the heart of Sauron's realm, his vast forge of fire and flame where all other powers in Middle-earth are subdued.